in our community um, as well. But the key issue now is to identify the cause to minimise uh, the risk that it happens again. Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Schuing on the future of onshore wind as part of Scotland's balanced energy mix. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. And I'll give a few moments for the Minister to get settled. In the meantime, members who would wish to ask a question of the Minister should perhaps press the request to speak button now. And I call on Fergus Ewing. Mr Ewing, around 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for your assistance and that of your office in scheduling this session at short notice. My statement concerns the proposal of the, Scot of the Conservative Government to halt new subsidies for onshore wind developments under the Renewables Obligation. Whilst the abrupt and early curtailment of the Renewable Obligation will have serious implications for people right across the United Kingdom, the economic and supply chain impacts are concentrated heavily in Scotland. Around 70% of all onshore wind projects in planning across the UK, the projects at risk, are located in Scotland. Last Thursday, Amber Rudd, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, lodged a written parliamentary statement in the House of Commons proposing to end new subsidies for onshore wind, specifically in relation to the renewables obligation. Ms Rudd confirmed this in her oral statement, presiding officer, at Westminster yesterday. Primary legislation will be introduced to close the RO from 1st of April next year, a year earlier than the industry and community developers had been led to expect. The future of other support schemes for onshore wind, contracts for difference and feed-in tariffs, the latter applying to smaller schemes, is unclear. However, the Energy Secretary has asserted that the UK has enough onshore wind to meet the Government's renewable energy commitments. I appreciate the Conservatives made a manifesto pledge to end new subsidies for onshore wind farms. But, Presiding Officer, that gave no notice to investors and developers that existing subsidies would be cut short. Developers have invested very substantial sums on the understanding that the RO is an existing scheme and not new subsidy, and also on the basis of a clearly stated UK government policy to ensure a smooth transition from RO to contracts for difference. The Scottish Government's view is that the planned transition policy should be maintained, consistent with the aim of moving onshore wind to a position of grid parity, that is, ending the requirement for subsidy by around the end of the current decade. Any other course gives rise to harmful uncertainty, undermines the UK's reputation with investors and risks wider consequences for investment far beyond the renewables sector. That argument, coupled with the fact that onshore wind is already the lowest cost large-scale option and hence on any rational analysis should be the last to be scrapped, must surely expose the Scottish and UK taxpayer to serious risk of judicial review at the instance of companies or indeed communities impacted. There can be no doubt that the move to close the RO prematurely will harm investment and jobs. There can be no doubt it will damage severely the prospects of community energy schemes uh, and in addition that ultimately it risks increasing the consumer cost of meeting renewable energy targets. Presiding officer, a large number of projects face being guillotined and losing the sunk investment in consequence. With Ofgem predicting derated capacity margins following, falling to as low as 2% this winter, to scupper any planned generation capacity is surely short-sighted. The key impacts will fall into four categories. First, consumers, secondly, communities, third, companies, and fourthly, our renewable energy goals. Consumers will pay the price in their energy bills. Onshore wind is the cheapest large-scale source of renewable electricity, a fact presiding officer admitted by Amber Rudd in her Radio 4 interview last week. Replacing onshore wind with more expensive technologies could can cost consumers two to three billion pounds more. That's the clear warning from Keith Anderson of Scottish Power. 
In relation to the impact on individuals and households, many communities will suffer. Communities planning to develop their own local schemes and those in line to gain from community benefit payments will lose from the early closure of the RO. In the last 12 months, communities across Scotland received nearly £9 million from community benefit payments. Further community income streams could be lost. For example, RES, Renewable Energy Systems, estimate that up to £46 million of community benefit could be lost in addition to the revenue from local construction and business rates. Falk Renewables Wind has three projects at risk from early closure of the RO. These are only two of the many commercial companies that have uh, made clear the commercial damage that this decision is going to cause. If their projects and Falk are not completed, 10.4 million will be lost to the local community and 11 communities will lose out on the opportunity to invest in cooperative investment schemes. The third impact presiding officer hits companies investing in Scotland. According to Scottish Renewables, up to £3 billion worth of onshore wind projects and over 5,000 jobs are at risk. Let me just repeat that. £3 billion of onshore wind projects in Scotland and over 5,000 jobs at risk. Order. Let's hear the, the Minister. I don't think this is a matter for jocularity, despite the Conservatives' laughter. Minister, just continue with the statement. The impacts reverberate across the wider supply chain, including ports and harbours, transmission and distribution, consultancy, universities and the civil engineering sector, to name but a few. The CBI has warned, and I quote, that this sends a worrying signal about the stability of the UK's energy policy framework and could damage our reputation as a good place to invest in energy infrastructure. <coughs> Above all else, investors value certainty, while sudden changes undermine trust and deter investment. Finally, RO closures raise serious questions about the deliverability of the UK's 2020 renewable energy target. The target is to meet 15% of total energy needs from renewable sources by 2020, well below the EU's overall aim of 20%. And the latest outturn figures, presiding officer, for 2013-14 show that the UK achieved just 5.4%, uh, barely a third of the target to meet. Last week, the European Commission published a progress report which identified the UK among a group of companies needing to reflect on whether their policies and tools are sufficient and effective in meeting the renewable energy objectives. As Climate Change Secretary and the person who will represent the UK, in the crucial UN climate change talks in Paris in December, Amber Rudd must not ignore the major contribution that onshore wind can make to compensate for slow progress in other areas such as heat and transport. Yet, her first act in the new government is to cut green energy provisions, setting a terrible example to the rest of the world. Presiding officer, the UK government is minded to offer grace periods to projects that possess a planning consent, a grid connection agreement, as well as evidence of land rights as of the date of Ms Rudd's statement to Parliament, namely the 18th of June. I have put to Amber Rudd that affording reasonable protection to developers would suggest that grace periods should offer as much flexibility as possible and apply to projects in all stages of planning. That is not my preferred course, but it would at least limit the damage caused. The Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell MP, speaking on the BBC's Sunday Politics show, indicated that the grace period will apply when, and I quote, there is any prospect of a grid connection being delivered. Any prospect of a grid connection being delivered. We welcome that change in the UK government's position and we'll be looking for that to be extended further. In conclusion, presiding officer, after several years of uncertainty for the industry whilst electricity market reform was being devised, there was a fleeting period of relative stability. But once again, uncertainty shrouds the entire sector. Our concern is not limited to early closure of the RO. Industry has been clear that longer term targets and commitments are fundamental to maintain investment. It is crucial, therefore, that the UK government provides early information on the future of contracts for difference, including the date of the next allocation round and the level of budget assigned. In conclusion, presiding officer, I call on the UK government 
to provide the clarity required on long-term policy for renewables and limit the damage to investment in Scotland. Onshore wind is the least expensive source of renewable electricity and to ignore the massive resource available from Scotland and squander the huge economic benefits for consumers, communities and companies is utter folly. The Minister will now take questions on issues raised in his statement. I need to finish at 2.50, so I would appreciate members' cooperation. Lewis MacDonald, then Murdo Fraser. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. Last week's announcement by the Conservative Government at Westminster clearly is bad for jobs, bad for investment and bad for the environment, and it will end up costing consumers more. We deplore the bad decision the UK Government has made. We also want to hear today what the Scottish Government intends to do to address the impacts of the early ending of support for onshore wind across the UK. Given the number of jobs at risk identified by Scottish Renewables, can the Minister tell us what steps the Scottish Government will take to strengthen the skills base in the sector and that, to ensure that as many jobs as possible and skills are protected for the future? The Conservative Government appears to be totally confused as to its own policy on a grace period for planned projects. Can the Minister tell us today what discussions his officials have had to date on implementation of a grace period with the Department for Energy and Climate Change and what illumination he has received uh, from that direction? Of course, bad policy from another government should not undermine progress towards the renewable energy targets set in Scotland with broad cross-party support. What steps will the Scottish Government now take to bring forward deployment of solar PV and other forms of low-carbon electricity generation to meet the gap left by the UK Government's misguided approach to onshore wind? And finally, will the Minister examine the impact on consumers of these proposals and of the alternatives which are available, and will he report to Parliament on this as soon as possible in the autumn? Minister. Uh, well, well, yes, I, I will certainly update Parliament in the autumn. Yes, uh, Lewis MacDonald is absolutely right. The jobs and skills are absolutely essential. Indeed, my very first uh, engagement uh, in this portfolio, Minister, was in uh, the Kingdom of Fife in uh, the opening of a, of a course for young people to acquire uh, skills in renewable energy. And that, those courses have been replicated in Dumfries and Ayr and Inverness and throughout the country because we expected that there would be a continued, consistent policy support for the industry from the UK who said there would be in 2013 when they reviewed the rocks and said the system would continue until 2017 before abruptly uh, lifting the commercial carpet from a group of investors. The grace periods, I myself have had discussions with Amber Rudd, as I stated. I argued that we should take a broad interpretation of this, and I was pleased that David Mundell uh, on television said clearly that those uh, projects with the prospect of a grid connection should qualify. And that's very important because in parts of the Highlands, for example, uh, a, and many other parts of Scotland, grid connections are just not available at the current time. Uh, uh, and therefore, a, there, there needs to be a recognition of that. Um, so far as other forms of energy are concerned, of course, we continue to support solar, as mentioned, as well as biomass. Uh, hydro, of course, and we have very substantial capacity in hydro anaerobic uh, digestion, and of course, tidal wave uh, energy Scotland and the work in the tidal sector. So I think it's reasonable to say we have been fairly consistent in supporting renewable energy across the board. That will continue in response to Lewis MacDonald's question. But the last point I make is, you know, he asks, well, what will we do to fill the gap and the damage caused by this UK decision? I would far prefer to try to persuade the UK government to ameliorate the announcement it's made so that at least there is damage mitigation. And I will be meeting Amber Rudd tomorrow and I will be arguing that point very strongly, uh, presiding officer, because I do believe that the UK government simply doesn't understand the consequences of what it has done. Margaret Fraser. Uh, can I thank the minister for advance sight of his statement? Presiding officer, communities across Scotland have been delighted yeah, by a yeah. UK Conservative government standing up for their interests, in contrast to a central belt SNP administration in Edinburgh, which has done nothing to assist them over the last eight years. Now, the Minister makes extravagant claims about the damage to the economy and job losses as a result of this move. 
But isn't this exactly the scaremongering we heard from the Minister and his backbench colleagues when the previous government reduced the subsidies for solar PV installations? At that time, we heard dire warnings of job losses and business closures, but the solar industry today is stronger than it has ever been. The Minister has been caught crying wolf once before. Why should we believe him this time? Secondly, can the Minister confirm whether the Fergus Ewing delivering the statement to us today is the same Fergus Ewing who in 2007 railed against the then Scottish Executive and the then Energy Minister for the overdevelopment of onshore wind yeah. and is quoted in the Strathspey and Badenoch Herald as saying, the SNP believes that many other forms of renewable energy are the future, not unconstrained wind farms. Yeah. Presiding officer, won't communities across Scotland be right to draw a contrast between a Conservative Party which in opposition promises to act on the overdevelopment of onshore wind and then government delivers on its promises and an SNP which in opposition promises to do one thing but in government does exactly the opposite? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, uh, well, I've never argued uh, in favour that there should be unconstrained development of onshore wind. <laughs> Order. Let me, let, we didn't get many facts there from Mr Fraser, so perhaps I should introduce one or two. Uh, there have been 68, 36 onshore wind applications, 65% have been consented and 22% rejected, 13% withdrawn. So we have considered each application, as we are required to do as Ministers of the Scottish Government, strictly on their merits. We have, in addition address the shortcomings of the previous policy to which I have alluded in previous remarks by increasing community benefit. When uh, Alan Wilson was the Minister for Energy, I suggested to him that we should increase the community benefit so that communities would gain. Do you know what he said, Presiding Officer? If we did that, we would risk all the development going to Wales. Well, we've done it. We've increased the community benefit uh, sort to £5,000 a megawatt, 10000 for community schemes, and above all, we think communities should have a stake, an ownership stake, stake uh, in matters. And, of course, we've tightened up the designations in relation to impact questions, re-cumulative impact guidance, uh, and the designation of wild land. So, of course, I was never in favour of unconstrained development, uh, presiding officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to clarify that uh, to the satisfaction of every reasonable person in the chamber. Um, the rest of uh, Mr Fraser's remarks were of somewhat of a political nature, but could I just finish by saying a bit gently to the Conservatives that the stance they appear to take in the front bench uh, of total opposition to wind power does not, with all respect, appear to be one that is followed in practice by some of their members, because there are three camps, there are three camps in the Tories, the Scottish Tories at least, there are those who support onshore wind, there are those who are against and then there are some who have one of their own. Can I just remind members that I need a brief question and a brief answer? Rob Gibson, followed by Sierra Boyack. Thank you, President Officer. I represent areas in the north where the human communities are the most endangered species and fully support onshore wind, and where they know that Scotland's renewable electricity has displaced 11.9 megatons of CO2 equivalent in 2013. Can the Minister offer any further information on the impact of the decision to end onshore wind farm subsidies that will have on Scotland's ability to meet its climate change targets that are underpinned by our renewable targets? Minister. Well, I think it will make it challenging, as, I, as I've already said, for obvious, uh, uh, for, for obvious uh, reasons to meet the 220 target of renewables of delivering 100 per cent of green energy by 2020. Um, we, this is particularly disappointing because we effectively met our interim target for signing officer of 50% by 2014, a year uh, ahead of schedule. Uh, and I would emphasise our support for a broad range of renewable energy sources of generation, including hydro, which was at a record high level of up to 26%. But, you know, the, the last point I make in response to Rob Gibson is that the mystery is how the UK government can square the decision that they've taken, a perverse and foolish decision, with extremely damaging consequences, uh, with, the, with the commitment in their manifesto to achieving climate change targets. 
Uh, how on earth can they square that circle, presiding officer? We don't believe that it's possible. Sarah Boyack, followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, given the importance of renewables to meeting our climate change targets, which stands out as a key uh, driver of green jobs in Scotland, what assistance can the Scottish Government offer the industry, um, given the importance of this investment across the whole of the country and the huge uncertainty where companies who have been investing in good faith now face a huge uncertainty in terms of their future investment? What practical steps can the Minister take to secure those green jobs and to secure that green electricity? First Minister. Well, first of all, um, these benches are happy to work with the Labour Party on this issue, both here and in Westminster, to see what can be done to ameliorate an appallingly bad decision, indeed an irrational decision. Uh, the one thing ministers should not do, presiding officer, is make irrational decisions, because the Wensbury test says if you do so, then you may well face judicial review. Why is it irrational? Because they've cut the subsidies for the least expensive method of generating renewable electricity. That is irrational. What can we do to help companies? Well, in the short term, presiding officer, I will be repeating the call to improve the grace period provision. But secondly, and, and most important of all, perhaps, is this, uh, that unless companies in this area of business know whether or not there will be any provision in the contracts for difference for onshore wind, there is simply no route to market. They have spent millions of pounds on schemes and there is no route to market. Now, the UK government hasn't said when they will end the confusion they've generated by their announcement by explaining what their CFD plans will be. But in direct response to Sarah Boyack's question, the best thing that all of us can do is demand that the UK Climate Change and Energy Secretary end that confusion by announcing what provision she will make in contracts for difference for onshore wind. Otherwise, there are many companies, a great deal of whom I addressed this morning at a conference uh, of onshore wind developers, many companies who may simply close up shop and take their investment to other countries in Europe. Can I just say to members, I've got eight members who wish to ask a question. I've got less than eight minutes left of the statement period. Liam MacArthur, followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you, President Novice. I thank the Minister for sight, early sight of his uh, statement and agree wholeheartedly uh, with his verdict that this decision uh, is bad for consumers, communities and companies, including many in my own constituency. Does he agree that the lack of prior consultation and clarity even now about the details of what this decision will mean in terms of grace periods, etc., is damaging future confidence not simply in onshore wind, uh, but also in the wider sector, including the marine renewables and the wider supply chain? And from his experience, would he care to contrast the progressive approach and commitment uh, to renewables shown by my colleague and the former Energy Sec Secretary, Ed Davey, uh, and the rather reckless and short-sighted attitude of this current Conservative government? Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I've always said that Ed Davey and I did work together in, for example, delivering the connections to the islands. Uh, and in that particular regard, since he, he raised the issue, could I say that he is absolutely right. The decision that was uh, announced by the UK government will make it more difficult to raise the investment required in all areas for renewables for the simple fact that bankers and commercial companies, when they see a government, uh, the UK government in this case, acting irrationally, curtailing uh, incentives a year before they promised, those bankers, those investors will think, what's going to be next? Uh, and therefore, I'm seriously concerned that although the previous UK government with uh, Ed Davies Minister did commit, and that was welcome, to uh, a remote island CFD and obtaining state aid clearance and announcing the CFD incidentally in July, a timetable to which Alan Sykes and others uh, are committed at Viking, for example, uh, and is also important in Orkney and the Western Isles, it now looks to me uh, as if the delivery of connections to the islands will, by virtue of the impacts of this decision, be made much more difficult. The smiles are going off their faces now, signing officer. Perhaps the penny is beginning to drop about what they've done. Dave Thompson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, does the Minister uh, have an update on the, how the recent changes on the inshore, onshore wind farm subsidies will affect the consented Glen Olenish wind farm development in Skye, in my constituency, uh, a development which has massive public support right uh, around the whole community and which will have great benefits to Skye? And does he have any concerns about support for pumped storage? 
Uh, well, I, I do have concerns for, for the uh, uh, progress of pump storage because the last UK government failed to engage uh, with us in advancing pump storage. We have uh, uh, two existing facilities, but we also have one consented in the Great Glen and another at Cruachan, between them around about 1.2 gigawatts. Uh, and we believe that that should play a part. And of course, it counteracts the stochastic nature of wind energy. Uh, regarding the first question he raised, presiding officer, I have been contacted by the director of Kilmac, uh, which uh, is uh, taking forward the Glen Ulinish scheme. My information is that uh, a number of local crofters were due to benefit from the lease. I should also say the Scottish Government uh, may benefit as well, just for the sake of transparency, because uh, of our interests in the land. But uh, this is one of many, many schemes uh, that Mr Thompson will be aware of in the West Highlands, in Argyle, in Dumfries, in Aberdeenshire. Many, many schemes where communities have an interest, but the guillotine has been brought down by what appears to me to be a perverse and irrational decision by the UK government taken for the interests of placating their gentlemen from the shires and taking it on the basis, uh, if that's not an overpolite way of framing it, taken, in other words, presiding officer, for political reasons rather than reasons of good governance. Can I just say to members, I want a brief question, one question, Claudia Beamish, followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, uh, does, and does the Minister agree with me that many of the communities um, which will now be struggling uh, are actually in rural isolation and some of them have already been subjected to open cast restoration challenges and are trying to do their best to develop sustainably? So can he outline what action the Scottish Government can take to help support these communities who find themselves left high and dry by an ill-thought-out Tory decision? Minister, briefly. Well, we, we will continue to support communities who wish to gain uh, from the resources in their parts of Scotland by helping them by investment from the Renewable Energy Investment Fund, from the Local Energy Investment Fund, which is designed to stimulate investments and provide for the difficulty of finalising projects in time by investing the money and then offering communities a stake. We will also continue with the CARE scheme, which provides advice. We will continue with Local Energy Scotland, who have excellent people who spend their time visiting communities and listening to them and helping them navigate issues like grid connections and planning permission with which members of communities may have had zero experience. We will help them in all of these ways. But at the end of the day, presiding officer, if the policy support isn't there from the UK government, then I anticipate that a great many of these communities around Scotland will face the Tory guillotine that was announced this week. Mike McKenzie, followed by Patrick Harvey. The Minister has suggested that the early withdrawal of the renewable obligations for onshore wind has knock-on effects for other sectors. Does he agree with me that the uncertainty caused has serious and negative consequences for other renewable technologies like wave and tidal power? Minister. Uh, well, yes, and not least, not least for the very obvious fact, or at least obvious to those of us who have spent uh, uh, hundreds of hours meeting the companies, that many of the companies that have the onshore schemes that now are guillotined are also offshore wind developers. And they had been planning to do the onshore projects prior to taking part and delivering the execution of offshore projects. Now they find themselves perhaps with little or nothing to do in the UK. So perhaps like one of them that I spoke to on Friday in Inverness at a meeting chaired by the local Chamber of Commerce, they may already be contemplating switching their investment uh, to countries such as Sweden. Now, what is essential, presiding officer, is the UK end this uncertainty by bringing forward clarity on contracts for difference for wind projects. If they fail to do that by the end of this Westminster parliamentary session, then I fear the worst. And the, the virus of lack of confidence in investors is contagious and it goes to other sectors, uh, including offshore and other areas of renewables, because how can they rely on the UK government's promises that there will be incentives that will last for a certain period when they come along without notice, without consultation, and abruptly bring that to a halt? They can't. And that is the way that both investors and banks behave, as I thought the Conservatives understood. Patrick Harvey, then Alex Johnson. 
Thank you. Isn't it clear that if this decision, which the Minister rightly describes as irrational, is successful in its goal of undermining the onshore wind industry, other sectors of the Scottish economy are going to have to work much harder if we're ever going to reach our climate change targets. Uh, will he uh, initiate a discussion with colleagues to discuss how much more can be done from the heat and transport sectors, for example, if we're going to restore uh, our trajectory on the climate change targets? Briefly, Minister. Uh, well, we have ambitious targets in heat in, in, to take 40,000 uh, houses into district heating, for example, uh, and uh, we have a heat map and uh, a plan in that regard, as Mr Harvey knows. Uh, my, colleague, uh, my colleague Derek Mackay is taking forward the work in transport, but I think he is right that if we can't achieve our targets uh, as we'd expected in this area, it uh, will be more difficult to do so, and there would then need to be focus, more focus on other areas. Brief question, Alec Johnson. Will the Minister concede that Michael Fallon, more than a year before the election, made it clear that subsidies would be withdrawn in the event of a Conservative win? Would he concede further well, that one this question. party have Minister, campaigned can we have a repeatedly for a diverse Order. energy mix? One question, Minister. Um, do you really need to put all your eggs in one basket and Minister. to say we told you so? <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad that Alec Johnson has raised Michael Fallon because Michael Fallon was responsible as the architect for the daddy of them all, so far as subsidy. It was he who drew forward the Hinkley Point project, a Hinkley Point project which gets a subsidy not for 15 years, not like the... onshore wind, but 35 years, right? And the total, the total cost of that subsidy is 35 billion pounds plus 10 billion loan guarantees, making it, according to Peter Atherton of Liber Liberal, Liberum Capital, quotes, the most expensive power station in the world, and the total cumulo subsidy for one nuclear power station is equivalent, presiding officer, to four times the amount, four times the amount of the aggregate subsidy for all renewables in the first decade of the RO's operation. Thank you. That ends the Minister's statement. My apologies to Stuart Stevenson and Christian Allard for not calling you. The next item of business is a stage three proceedings on the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill. I'll allow a few moments for members to change the desk.